Governments are finding it harder and harder to censor information that they deem harmful or potentially dangerous. In a time where answers are just a swipe away, how will governments rise to the challenge of banning and censoring media that may have devastating consequences to its audience? In the past, this was not so much of an issue, but in the age of social media and streaming, it remains to be seen how they will cope. Number 5 Bare Fist, the sport that wouldn't die, has been rejected not once but twice by the BBFC or the British Board of Film Classification for its raw depiction of violence and promotion of bare knuckle boxing. Bare knuckle boxing has remained a controversial topic in the UK. While it's not illegal, it does not fall under any regulating body, making it a lawless sport. Bare knuckle boxing does not require a license to operate, and the government does not usually get involved. In 1997, Bare Fist was submitted to the BBFC for classification. However, it failed to gain one after the board feared it would encourage children and young adults to take up bear boxing with each other. The documentary follows the life of Lenny McLean, aka the governor, who's often described as the hardest man in Britain. McLean was a boxer, criminal, bodyguard, and weightlifter, and the BBFC were concerned that portraying his life in a positive light would have lasting effects on the British youth. It wasn't just McLean's life that the documentary displayed, with the BBFC alleging that the documentary gave details on how to win fights by lacing bandages with broken glass and other tactics that could prove fatal. The documentary was submitted a second time. However, the BBFC stood by their decision to not give the documentary a classification. Without a classification, the documentary was not able to be shown in cinemas or be released to home video. Number 4 Produced in 1966, Titicut Foley's by Frederick Wiseman has only ever been seen by a select few after being shown at the 1967 New York Film Festival, the documentary was banned and taken out of circulation and for good reason. The 1966 documentary follows Wiseman as he investigates the horrors of the State Hospital for the Criminally Insane in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. This was the first time that many people were confronted with the hard truths of insane asylums, as they got a first-hand look into how some of the most vulnerable in society were treated with such disdain. Upon entering the state hospital for the criminally insane, viewers are met with scenes of 900 patients suffering from different levels of mental illness, all housed together regardless of whether they've committed violent crimes or not. As one put it, quote, we are literally taken into a madhouse. It's obvious from the start that patients are not being looked after properly and are subjected to humiliation and neglect daily. In the documentary, Wiseman focused on a patient who's simply known as Jeb. According to those who have seen the documentary, throughout the film, Jem is constantly taunted by the guards who bully him and subject him to horrible punishments. During the exchange, one guard can be heard shouting at him, Why is your room so filthy, Jem? The next shot shows that Jem's room is nothing more than an empty prison cell, devoid of bedding, clothing, or even personal belongings. Staff at the asylum are seen carrying on as normal, continuing to treat the patients with indifference and cruelty. 
as if the film cameras aren't there at all. Throughout the documentary, patients are seen heavily medicated and left naked in rooms and corridors while others are subjected to quote-unquote treatments that have long since been banned. The controversial documentary also hears the story of a man who'd been involuntarily committed to the asylum for two years for being drunk in public. When Wiseman dug deeper into the story, he found that this conviction was beyond ridiculous. According to the patient, he'd painted his fruit cart to look like a zebra, thinking it would catch the eyes of customers and prompt them to take a further look. However, Massachusetts authorities spun the story saying that the man was drunk in public and insane. Disturbingly, a 1968 study found that 30 inmates at the state hospital for the criminally insane had been admitted illegally, while others had been admitted for minor indiscretions. As a result of the controversial documentary and study, a man named Charles was finally released in 1967 after he'd been arrested and placed in the asylum in 1910. It was found that Charles was only supposed to be in the asylum for two years, but Massachusetts authorities had made it impossible for patients to access legal or financial aid to secure their release. The documentary remains extremely controversial and Massachusetts authorities petitioned for many years to keep the documentary under wraps over concerns for what they called patient confidentiality. On the surface, this may appear to be a thoughtful consideration by the authorities. However, they were most likely petitioning to keep the documentary suppressed as they didn't want the world to know about the horrors that went on inside the asylum for the criminally insane. Number 3 In the early 1990s, Liberia was gripped in a bloody civil war as a result of the rebellion led by Samuel Doe in the 1980s. Doe had overthrown the Liberian government in the 1980s and went on to hold elections which of course he won despite backlash from his opposition in the country. Unhappy with what they saw as fraudulent elections, the NPFL battled with different rebel groups for control over the country, going up against the independent National Patriotic Front of Liberia. The civil war in Liberia is complex and involves many different groups. Without going too much into detail, the INPFL won and took control over Liberia's capital. Monrovia. In 1997, the two groups, the NPFL and the INPFL, had come together and Charles Taylor, the leader of the NPFL, was elected as president of Liberia. The Liberian Civil War had a devastating impact on Liberia, leaving much of the country in ruins and without proper infrastructure and damaged beyond repair. Families were torn apart and those who had taken part in the conflict had either been put into prison or were suffering from mental health issues. In 2012, Shane Smith and the team at Vice went to Liberia to meet with the warlords who took part in the civil war and to see what conditions were really like inside Liberia. Smith and his crew were confronted with the horrific reality of an 80% unemployment rate and deplorable living conditions. The 2012 documentary, The Cannibal Warlords of Liberia, follows Smith and his crew as they attempt to track down a man who goes by General Butt Naked. After bribing prison officers and meeting with different contacts, Smith and his crew are finally granted the all-important interview with General Butt Naked who is keen to show the world that he's reformed and become a better man. Before the Civil War, the general was a member of the Sarpo tribe and was appointed as a high priest at just 11 years old. 
He was then appointed as Samuel Doe's spiritual advisor, and when the Civil War began, he was called into action. He went under the name of General Butt Naked, a common practice amongst army generals in Liberia. Two generals who fought each other were called General Mosquito and General Mosquito Spray, with the rival opting for the name to mock his enemy. When asked why he'd chosen the name Butt Naked, he replied that he believed if he and his troops were completely naked that they couldn't be hit by bullets. After examining the story of how General Butt Naked came to be, the general takes Smith and his crew to the village and explains how he's now a reformed man. Following the Civil War, he was pardoned for all of his crimes after converting to Christianity and becoming a preacher and an anti-violence advocate. The documentary remains controversial for its graphic content and honest look into Liberian society following the Civil War. Many have also deemed it controversial for trying to portray the general in a positive light, which leaves the question, can someone like the general ever be fully rehabilitated? Number 2 In 1993, Damon Fox released the highly controversial shockumentary Traces of Death. Traces of Death styled itself after the film Faces of Death, but with one major difference. Unlike Faces of Death, Traces of Death contains real footage of death and injury instead of reenactments. This documentary includes footage from well-known crimes, leaving family members horrified that their loved ones' last moments have been allowed to be featured in a film. It's not just footage from disasters and murders that are featured. The documentary also showcases the only video evidence of Ilsa Koch's crimes. Koch was an infamous commandant at multiple concentration camps between 1937 in 1943. The documentary also includes footage of animals being harmed and animals harming humans, leading animal rights groups to challenge the film and its home video release. With such graphic content, it's no surprise that the documentary came under fire from critics and censorship boards. Despite its initial controversy, Fox went on to produce four more films in quick succession with the content only becoming darker as the films went on. Copies are available in the US, however, for British viewers, it may be nearly impossible for you to get your hands on a copy. In 2005, the British Board of Film Classification decided that Traces of Death would not be provided an age certification, effectively banning the film, even for those over the age of 18. This was backed up by saying, quote, the film has no journalistic, educational, or other justifying context for the images shown. Meanwhile, in Australia, a copy of the box set featuring traces of death 1 through 5 was confiscated in 2003 after the legal system added the film to their list of prohibited imports. Number 1 The 2014 film Citizen 4 is the third part of a trilogy of films that explore the aftermath of 9-11 and the many conspiracy theories that surround that tragic day in American history. In 2013, journalist and film director Laura Poitras had been working on a piece about in-depth monitoring systems that had been put in place in the United States as a direct result of the September 11th attacks in New York City. These programs were created under the guise of keeping American citizens safer, but Laura felt that there was way more to the story than simple surveillance. Over the years, there'd been rumors about illegal wiretapping carried out by the NSA and other entities within the United States, 
It didn't take long for Laura to receive an encrypted email from a person who only referred to themselves as Citizen 4. The man behind this email wanted to speak with her about extremely sensitive information regarding her research. So in June of 2013, Laura decided to take a trip to Hong Kong to meet with Citizen 4 in a secluded hotel room, far away from the surveillance of the United States government. It doesn't take long for Laura to realize that she's just scheduled a meeting with the one and only Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden had previously worked for companies like Dell, but was eventually hired to work with both the CIA and NSA. During his time with these organizations, he was asked to carry out many shady dealings. He repeatedly spoke with his superiors about the ethical concerns he had about these programs, but his questions were continually ignored. This caused him to reveal thousands of secret NSA documents to the public after reaching out to Laura and taking part in her documentary, simply titled Citizen 4. Edward hoped that in doing so, it would open the American people's eyes to the corrupt dealings that are going on behind closed doors within the US government. The documentary goes on to claim that many of the illegal surveillance programs that are being implemented by the US government were put in place after 9-11 and that the government merely used the 9-11 tragedy as a scapegoat for their own malicious deeds. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to click that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.